I may need to be refreshed on what the topic, what the topic is. I think the topic is um, how to avoid being crucified on the waste of the so, I think you're right. And Bill and I both agreed and are both involved with trying to replace the current system, plurality, also known as first past the post, known as plurality, with an alternative voting method. Bill and I are, I feel, in concurrence with, there's, we're, in my mind, we're going to continue being noise of the noise until three things change. The three things are ballot access, debate access, and alternative voting method. With regards to ballot access, I'm very, very, very grateful to Richard Winger, who has made ballot access such a, such a cleaner issue that all, all states have loosened it up. Instead of it, instead of it, that instead of it going into a, um, a more Oklahoma drift in ignorance, Richard's brought transparency, accountability, and we've had wonders with regards to ballot access. With regards to debate access, what our America Initiative is doing, I think is super. Pushing, pushing the legal case on debate access. The third leg of the stool is alternative voting methods. I currently happen to be an advocate of approval voting. My colleague, esteemed, is an advocate of instant runoff voting. With, with caveats, which he'll go into right now. Well, no, I was going to say, if you're talking single member elections, right. yes, I, I, would, I would agree with that, if you're talking single member elections. And, okay, mentioning sing, what we're call, talking about is single winner districts, where the district is only electing one representative, one candidate. Then it ought to be either approval voting or instant runoff voting. If in my mind, even though the, the better legislative election method might be proportional representation, I feel that's too, too large a lift for the moment. It's my opinion. Well, there is going to be, uh, it's interesting you bring that up, Frank, because there is going to be a, I think it's called the Voyager for Voters Choice Act, I want to say. There actually is going to be legislation I don't think it's been introduced yet, but it's on the way to allow states to go to multi-member districts uh, and, and through where they would elect members to the U.S. House of Representatives through, through choice voting, is what we call it, sort of single transferable vote. Single transferable vote. Uh, we have is mandated by an act of Congress, I think from 1966. There used to be, going back to the 60s and before, there used to be multi-member districts in certain states for U.S. House of Representatives. That ended about 50 years ago. Uh, and, um, uh, and at that time, then, states were forced to, I think the last two, I want to say, were Hawaii and New Mexico. Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that, but in any event. Uh, but, but what this would do would be to return the option to states to uh, have uh, single member, uh, excuse me, multi-member district elections, which would be a form of proportional representation for the U.S. House. I'm not expecting that bill to go anywhere in the short term, but I think in the intermediate term, it's, it, it has possibilities. The history of multi-winner multi districts is that too often, and this is why it got abolished in the 50s, it was used as a, as a vehicle for discriminating against minorities. The majority would, would, okay, let's say electing five representatives from the district. 
if the majority is 60%, in some cases white, minority is 40%, 40% black, it happened that all five turned out to be white, laws got changed, they did away with multi-district there, but the, what's proposed in the law would rectify that distortion, is what's hoped for. Right, it, or it would allow, it would, it would, I think it would give minor party candidates uh, an actual shot at election if you had, you know, a, a three-member or five-member district. Uh, <coughs> Because if 20% of the vote, if the Libertarian got 20% of the vote, then or over one fifth, we might pick up one of those seats. So by I think with multi-member districts, our chances of actually winning seats in legislatures are greatly enhanced over the status quo. In the entire history of the Libertarian Party, unfortunately, um, there has been only one case where uh, we did one election to the state house in a single member district running only as a libertarian and not uh, with infusion. In New Hampshire, you might recall, some of you may recall about 20 years ago or even maybe a little less than that, we had some members of the New Hampshire House of Representatives. Now, that is the biggest House of Representatives in 400, 400 members of the New Hampshire House, but all of those people who were libertarians were elected through fusion. Uh, and also the districts in New Hampshire, only, there are only about 3,000 people, not even voters, 3,000 people, or 3,500 people per district. So they are very, very small, smallest in the nation, state house districts. Uh, but, uh, but all of them were elected ran on the Libertarian line and either the Republican line or the Democratic line. One guy actually ran, and I, at least one person, as a Libertarian and a Democrat. The only uh, a chance, the only, uh, Occasion where um, we won uh, in, in a single member district running only as a libertarian candidate was Andre Maru in Alaska. Many of you no doubt remember Andre Maru. He was our vice presidential candidate in 1988, presidential candidate in 1992. He won election in the Alaska House of Representatives in 1984, when he ran for election in 1986. He was defeated, and, and his uh, uh, political career, at least as an elected official in Alaska, was. So, so that's what we're up against. I mean, uh, it's, it's just it's very difficult because the dynamics of plurality voting, which both Frank and I agree that plurality voting is the pits. And, and, but the dynamic is there are all sorts of people that vote for this, but, but you, run into the, you run into this argument with the you're going to throw your vote away. You don't vote for the lesser to be with the wasted vote center. And, and there, are, there are arguments uh, certainly to address that. Some of them aren't the most sophisticated in my view. You know, I agree, the lesser of two evils is still evil, but you still have people who are going to make that strategic decision to vote for the lesser of two evils. And I think it's really the plurality. It's our voting system. Yes. It's our single member plurality voting system. Single member yes. legislative districts, person with the most votes wins. Um, that props up the two major parties in the United States. That is the reason that I hear Hear some people say, well, you know, if we had easy ballot access, the Libertarian Party would get elected. I say, okay, well, what about Colorado? Where right. we have a dozen and a half presidential candidates on the ballot every cycle, and the Libertarians are still noise of the noise. It, it's, you know, it, it, and there are other states, uh, Iowa, and I think there are some states that do have easy ballot access laws, but we're not getting elected. Or I run into the argument uh, that it's, it's a matter of money. Uh, well, if we had no campaign finance restrictions, then libertarians would get elected. I said, okay, but the person, the person who lives in Virginia. Said, well, what about the Commonwealth of Virginia, where there are no limits at all as to how much I, I wanted to give somebody running for governor a million bucks, which I don't want to do, but if I wanted to do that, I could do it in Virginia and not go to jail. And, and, uh, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, so I say, well, what about the fire libertarians being elected in Virginia? Well, no, it has to be the national. It won't just work in, in Virginia. And, and you know, I, I don't think that's the case at all. It, it's, and, and there are other ills as well. I mean, the, the fact that you have about half in, in Virginia is 62. We have odd we have odd year elections for state and house and senate and governor in Virginia. Uh, governor was 2013 when Robert Sardis did a fantastic job running as a libertarian in Virginia. But the House of 
House of Delegates is up every odd number of years. In November 2015, out of 100 single member districts in Virginia, for the Virginia House of Delegates, 62 had only one candidate on the ballot. Not one challenger, one candidate. 20 out of 40 for the Virginia Senate, one candidate on the ballot. Again, this is a manifestation of our single member plurality voting system. It props up the two major parties, it leads to uncompetitive elections uh, across the board, every level of government in the United States, and that's what Frank and I want to show Not that it would be easy, but, but that's what we, we absolutely agree on. That. So, I'll, I'll babble about approval voting, which I consider to be a two to three decade effort, if we're lucky, two to three decades. I can look back on current successes, if you call them successes. We've had a bill die in the State House in Colorado. We've had a bill die in the State House Committee in Colorado, State Senate Committee in Colorado, a home rule city. It's still a very, very tough fight. The reason I push approval voting is because in my mind, it's the simplest one to in, in act and incorporate into the system. My, my um, county clerks in Colorado say no additional cost for approval voting. Approval voting is um, it's the simplest way out of to get off the cross that's crucifying us, which is the wasted vote, lesser of two evils element. And do you want to go into IRB? Do you want yeah, to I'll explain I'm, how instant runoff voting works because of, because of, you know, it, 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 a lot of people, I mean, it, it don't know, and that's no sin because because it, it's it just one of the details of some of these systems are important. And I have found that, for instance, I went up to Alaska in 2002, uh, what, what vacations I take. In 2002, I took a week and a half vacation to go to San Francisco to work on the instant runoff voting initiative that passed in the city of San Francisco on March 5, 2002. And I went to Alaska in August, which was the last time we were to go to Alaska, and, uh, and uh, for a week and a half, there was a statewide initiative that failed on August 27, 2002, that would have brought instant runoff voting to all or nearly all offices in Alaska. Now, I will say this, there is a statewide initiative that will be on the ballot in May, this coming November, to adopt instant runoff voting, and which, which actually, these days, ranked choice voting. That's sort of, sort of gone to ranked choice voting and away from instant runoff voting, and it, it, it's, it's surprising how sensitive the phraseology is on some of these things. For instance, if it had choice voting, you know, it, we, we, at, at fair vote, we, we tend to call it a choice, a single transferable vote, choice voting. Now it's the same thing, but but uh, we, we find that there's a certain sensitivity out there uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, the phraseology of, of these voting systems. But anyway, with instant runoff voting, uh, you uh, simply rank your candidates as opposed to just having one vote cast for no more than one candidate. You rank your candidates. This candidate is my first choice. You have to pick a different, you can't vote for the same candidate a number of times. You have to say, this is my first choice candidate. If you want, you can select a second choice candidate. And if you want, you can select a third choice candidate. And theoretically, you could select even more if the system allows it. Now, I believe in San Francisco, you're limited to top three, I think, and in some instances you're, you're, you are restricted to your top three. What happens is they look at the first choice votes after all the voting is done. And if uh, some of the, and by the way, I want to say now, the uh, certain states are using uh, instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting for uh, military ballots overseas. That is, if they hold a runoff, they can't, they aren't going to have time to send ballots overseas to the military personnel or other voters. Uh, so, so they give them, they, they allow them to cast preferences in case the election goes to a runoff, which in several southern states happens. Um, but, but anyway, you look at the uh, uh, results. If somebody has a majority of first choice votes, they win. They got a majority of first choice votes. But if that doesn't happen, uh, then they begin eliminating candidates from the bottom up in terms of the number of 
votes, and then they transfer each voter's vote to their next choice candidate. Now, some of these votes can become exhausted, so to speak. Say if you voted for a minor party or independent candidate and did not care to choose, you had a choice, go with second or third choices, and say, no, I'm not going to do that, I'm just going to pass first choice. If, if your candidate is, is eliminated, your vote is exhausted. Uh, but they can transfer each voter's vote to their next choice candidate until someone has a majority of the non-exhausted votes. And that person then wins the election. Single, we're talking single winner elections here. And, and uh, what this does is it, it allows people, it gets away from that lesser to evil syndrome and, and helps ensure that somebody, by voting for a third party or independent candidate, does not unwittingly help elect a major party candidate they like to lose. Sir, you had Yeah, I, I'm from Maine. And oh, we, we had our Libertarian State Convention. We met a uh, speaker drafting the Green Party and a uh, speaker who was a Republican candidate um, speak for and against the ranked choice voting. What was the argument against it? Well, the, the primary argument in Maine, it was uh, a constitutional uh, one man, one vote issue. Okay, well, that is total canard. Because, because what does that mean? First of all, it is just one vote. Your vote just transfers. So it's wrong to say that somebody has more than one vote there. That is, and, and courts have ruled on that, by the way. Right. I can't tell you the precedents, uh, and I believe it's been other, in other states, but in Maine, it is particularly needed because you have a history of independent candidates. I mean, right now, Angus King is one of your US senators. He's an independent. And so, and you have, Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something like five of the last six gubernatorial elections have been yeah, won. Page one with 38. Yeah, they've been won with a plurality, not a majority. For five out of six gubernatorial elections, I think, of now. So, so Frank, to, just to approval voting also hears that argument of one man, one vote, and approval voting's response is one man, one ballot. On that one ballot you can check off as many candidates as you want with regards to approval voting. And now we'll continue on and sit right off. Yeah, I, I, there's nothing magical about one man, one vote. All voters need to be treated equally, ultimately. That's that's the real yardstick. But I just, I, when I hear arguments like that, I just, I, I, I'm not sure. I just wonder if the person making the argument really believes the argument they're making. Maybe it is, maybe it is. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask your help in explaining Candidates would be interested in other candidates' voters' second choice votes. Right? 
right? And, and they think, hmm, I don't want to treat that, treat that minor party candidate badly because I might need his supporters' second choice votes in order to get elected. So I think it would be more, it would make the process more inclusive of libertarian party candidates uh, in terms of uh, include, debate inclusion and, and media coverage. But I still, at the end of the day, think that our candidates would probably be eliminated uh, the vast majority of the time in the vote transfer process. With regards to approval voting, I believe I've been telling everyone, I do not promise libertarians victory with approval voting. What I do say that you'll have is viability and visibility because no longer are you penalized for casting a vote for a libertarian. The, and I would suggest that with approval voting, there's a more conspicuous, transparent visibility of the vote than, that sometimes gets washed out in the complications. The other is with regards to civility, I also feel that there would be more civility for fear of antagonizing crossover voters. Once again, this is what Bill was talking about with regards to with regards to instant runoff voting being treated better by both the media and major parties in order to have crossover voters. Mm -hmm. so, I'm sorry, sir, you had a question. Could you get into the uh, art contra arguments to wasting your vote? Okay. I ninety-eight percent of America buys into the wasted vote yeah. argument. 98% buys into the wasted vote argument. My <coughs> assistant here will pass out my little Dugarger card that shows the bell curve. I, I think it's valid. If you want, if you want to impact, if you want to impact uh, the decision-making process, you better be voting for one of the top two possible candidates. I'm, I think there's validity to the wasted vote argument. I'm sorry about that. And that's why, after 40 years of watching the libertarians be noise of the noise, I paused and I said, wait a second. How do we stop being noise of the noise? 98% for 40 years has been buying into that argument. I, the, the, the election method needs to be changed. If, Bill's turn. Yeah, it, okay. I would say strategic voting is not illogical. No. But I think it's been effective. I mean, you look at the state of affairs in the Republic, you know, people have been saying, well, oh, i got to vote Republican because oh, the government's just going to get too huge. All sorts of things. Well, what's happened? I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it, 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 again, it, it's not illogical, but I think people who have, who have voted Republican, in my opinion, over the last, I don't know, uh, 40 or 50 years, people have voted Republican because they wanted small government. You know what? <laughs> yeah, that was the real wasted vote if you look back over history. I mean, I bet it's my opinion. It's, it's been totally ineffective trying to reign in government. But well, what about the uh, argument that uh, the vote for a non-traditional, I mean, not the top two, uh, vote the other uh, party or candidate that actually has an undue influence on the eventual winner? This is parties have influenced the policies of the winners. Spoil, spoilers sabotage their philosophical allies. Is that what? Are well, we, not a, well, your argument is different, but let me. Bill's listening to you better than I am, so I'll have Bill yeah, respond. I, I suppose, I suppose that's. I, I, I think there's some. Look, I've heard that argument. I've heard that argument that prohibition came about and, uh, because of prohibition for candidates, particularly in California, uh, costing, I think, Charles Evans Hughes the White House instead of uh, uh, losing the Woodrow Wilson because of Charles Evans Hughes lost in California. I've heard that argument. And, and, and then prohibition came around after that. Um, I can't totally discount that, but, I, but at the end of the day, I, I think that, that we're, that's really the main reason, again, the waste of vote syndrome is the main reason that, that we're excluded from so much of the political activity in this nation. I mean, I've run for office six times, believe me. I mean, hell will freeze over the Fort Fairfax County Chamber of 
Congress, but allowed to have the Chamber of Commerce invites me to participate in the debate, I got my jaw would be the game. I mean, it's just, uh, and, and, uh, there are some that invited all the candidates, but but you get to some of these bigger organizations, no, they don't invite the mic, because it's, no, just, they don't, uh, it's just not real world event. These other candidates, they're the third party candidates, you know, this, we're about real world solutions and stuff. And, and so, no, I, I, uh, I don't think, I think we can influence, I think we, I actually think we would influence things more if we were included in these things either ranked choice voting or approval voting would enable that. Totally different than top two. Well, I despise top two. Okay. Top two is the worst. I've oh. heard top two being mentioned, I'll make sure. Oh, right top there. two is, is a killer for minor parties. Yes, and top two is where everybody runs, and if somebody doesn't get a majority, either that may not no. be a criteria at all, they're no. top two. Top right. two. Yeah, and you run into situations where uh, you, you can have, you've had situations in California where you've had two Democrats running in Two Republicans. Two Republicans in yes. getting, getting and, and it is uh, no top two is top two is headed for the great in my opinion. And and it's lost in Oregon, it's lost in Arizona. Uh, uh, people who a lot of people who supported top two are rethinking it now. And and I and I wouldn't be surprised I wouldn't be surprised to see it be done away with in California and, and Washington State at some point. A tangent to top two is that we have not mentioned here is gerrymandering. And any time, currently the law is um, districts of common interest is the phrase used as, as long as it's racially mixed. And, and, and gerrymandering is another hot topic because it's possible to, to slice and dice your opponents into smaller and smaller pieces. But Bill and I aren't going down that road, but we're grateful that you've been here as we watch people drift out the back and hear the door click. Uh, we uh, are grateful for approval, uh, alternative voting methods discussion. But I believe number one and then number two, your your question, sir. Okay, my question is you Within the context of our current circumstances, that one should not bother to argue against someone who is presenting you with a wasted vote syndrome argument? No, no, no. I, I, I will. I'll, I, I, I'll use all my ammunition against yes. them. Yes. I mean, I will, I will make the claim. Look, if you, if you think you're getting smaller government with the Republicans or greater civil liberties with the Democrats, Take open your eyes and yeah. take a look at history. It, it's just you're just going to get more of the same. You're just you're, you're not really getting what you think you're getting. Number one. But then I say, but on top of that, then it doesn't have to be that way. And I'll talk about ranked choice voting. Well, I will mention course. approval voting well, sometimes. Uh, but in, and then I'll talk about proportional systems in multi-member districts. But I'm saying that what you're telling what you're talking about is a manifestation of single-member plurality voting. It, it can change, sure. but even before it changes, you should rethink the ethics of your vote. The reason I, I bring it up is uh, I had a discussion the day before I came up here with uh, a friend of mine who is uh, the treasurer of our county screen party. Uh, and I was uh, discussing that with him, and he comes right out and tells me that, well, I've decided that I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. Uh, yes, I want to hear this. this, this is, okay. but you're better than we are. Uh, continue. Okay. Thank you, that's Tom. Okay, now my friendship is the treasurer of the Miami Dade County Green Party. He's a very good friend of mine. He and I know each other from anti war protests, and that's the main focus of both of our political views, right? Where uh, the Greens and the Libertarians come together. Now, Chip and I are discussing, I'm telling him, oh, well, I'm going up to the, uh, the nominating convention this weekend. You going up there? I said, no, well, uh, okay, fine. This last time we, came, I, we both came up here together for an event. Uh, we're discussing the election, and Chip says to me, well, I made up my mind that uh, I'm voting for Donald Trump. Okay. Uh, 
incident, and I asked her, well, where does this come from? Well, I was at dinner with Medea Benjamin, and if you're not familiar, the founder of Code Pink, uh, very strong anti-war uh, uh, advocacy group. Uh, and we all kind of dis discussed the situation. We're all just talking about people who are very knowledgeable about U.S. foreign policy, myself included, and that's my main focus. Uh, Chip tells me that, well, uh, I've we've made up our mind that we're voting for Donald Trump. Right away, I understand why. Because if you compare the, uh, the uh, apparent, what, what you can conclude are the foreign policy positions of Donald Trump, as opposed to Hillary Clinton, then, yeah, if you're very anti-war focused, you much prefer Donald Trump to any human being on, on the face of the earth who's named Hillary Clinton. Uh, so I understand right away what he's thinking. So right away, I start arguing against the wasted vote syndrome, which he's heard from me before. But basically, my argument against wasted vote syndrome, and I'd love to hear your comments on it, is that you're, the person who is un, under the sway of bursted votes, a wasted vote syndrome, is under a mis, un, mis Concept, we're laboring under a misconception, uh, a false premise as to what voting is. Voting is a civic responsibility. When you are in that voting group, you are exercising your right in the framework of a civic responsibility to make a choice as to who you believe would be the best candidate. It's something akin to serving on a jury. I'm sure you're all familiar with jury nullification. And basically, if you as a juror exercise jury nullification, even if you're on your own on a 12-man jury, 12-person jury, and you exercise that right, you are exercising, you are carrying out a moral obligation. And that's what you're doing when you're voting. This is the argument that I use to get the in vote syndrome. OK. Thank you. I'm wonderful. Your question is, who would be the best candidate? And I think the voters, 98% of them, follow up the question with, who is electable? Yes. And so when, when you ask the question, who is electable, it becomes the major parties. And, and I will continue to vote libertarian. That is what I believe. That is how I feel. That is how I'm going to continue to express my vote. But at the same time, when I hear somebody say, but they're not electable, I, the ice gets thin on, under me, and I. Well, but here's, here's, here's well, another argument. But I'd, like, I'd argument. like to let Bill. I'd like to let there's Bill. There's another come. argument, and that is so many states where the percentage of vote keeps us on the ballot. I mean, yes. it, it, that, that matters. And say, OK, well, think about this like the libertarian message, vote libertarian help keep us on the ballot and keep us politically viable in this state and in the United States. Your vote's not wasted if you do that. No. Yeah, of course, yeah, there, but that's, that's, a sort of, that's a secondary argument. It's very valid, but it's a secondary one. The basic argument, the fundamental argument that I try to make to them is that they have an obligation to choose the candidate that is best. Within the, the context of the, uh, of the something of the magnitude of a presidential election, it has to, the, the voter has to reckon with the fact that their individual vote will not make a difference. And you can challenge them with that by pointing out that they can take their vote after, after the fact, move it around amongst the candidate, take it out completely, and they'll still see the same result. Right, okay. We're, we're gonna move on if I may. I'm gonna, no. Your, I had a, just a comment from sure. it relates to the, the, the reality in, in the United States these days with low participation in elections is that your vote counts even more. I mean, we had in a major city in, in Maine uh, a school budget election that was decided on six votes because only, you know, single digit percentage came out for the election. And if we, you know, even our candidates can, can buck that and we can get people to vote their conscience and show up. Uh, so my original question was about basic vote. 
I'm not going to go there because that's going to address what we want. My next question has to do with viability of this building. Now, under approval voting, I can see that instead of getting 1%, you get a competing for that one precious vote. You can get 20 or 30%. So visibility under approval voting, I get. How does visibility work under IRP or interest voting? How does your candidate get more visibility if he's first eliminated? Well, simply because there are going to be more people who are going to be considering voting for him with their first choice vote than voting for him under a plurality vote. I, I think that, that it would open up, again, and because the press would perceive that more people would be interested in considering the vote for the person, then, then there would be more coverage, and I think we'd be included in a lot more debates. So if I understand you correctly, the first choice voting would be reported mm -hmm. as these are the first choices, but he's been eliminated. Right. I mean, yes. I mean, there would, well, I mean, there would only be a single winner race, there's only one winner. So, I mean, you know, right. that, that uh, yeah, that, that, I'm just saying that in a three way, yeah, I mean, the Libertarian candidate would probably be the one under currently that would be eliminated, but the thing is, is that uh, you, we wouldn't be faced with a waste of both argument anymore. And, and that would enhance our candidacies in several ways. Maybe I can help with this a little bit. This year, we're probably going to have Jill from the Green Party, Tucker from the Constitution Party, the Libertarian, and the R's and the D's. It's entirely possible that the uh, recent poll indicated that the Bernie Sanders supporters, 25% will not vote for Hillary, according to the poll. So it's very possible that we won't be the first one eliminated. The Constitution Party or the Green Party may be, in which case, we may become the second choice for the for the first choice for the, some of the Sanders people, but the second choice for the Greens based on the, the war platform, the war plan that we're talking about. Oh, oh, so I'm thinking that, you know, yeah, it has viability even if we are eliminated, but we're not going to be the first one eliminated. We start to get higher visibility now. And our media guy question? Uh, yes, I guess it's a two part question. Uh, one, would, would approval voting or IRV, what would be the reasons uh, for the Libertarian Party within our internal elections to use real voting and IRV voting? How would that benefit us there? And also in external elections, general elections, uh, why would approval voting or IRV voting, uh, what are their uh, strengths and weaknesses for using it there? Well, go ahead. You want to address that? I'll from an approval voting perspective, what I say about major parties, major factions, is fewer spoilers and less sabotage. For minor factions, more viability and visibility. For the candidates, more civility for because they don't want to antagonize crossover voters. For the voters, more, more, um, for the voters, more honesty for expressing themselves. For internal libertarian events, I think that's that's part of the, those payoffs would be there. And for external elections, it would be um, once again we as libertarians would have more viability and visibility. And uh, just. Uh, uh, on, on a national level, it gets decided in state legislatures. Nothing in the Constitution specifically addresses elections per election methods per se. The state legislature decides it for that state. And so, uh, when it comes to lobbying, you're lobbying the legislature. So well, it could, could also be decided through uh, initiative. Initiative process, yes. It could yes. be decided that way as well. Well, first of all, I mean, uh, let's take the Libertarian National Committee. Um, we've got four officers, and you've got five at large. Well, we had a change in Columbus, Ohio. So now the, the at large representatives on the Libertarian National Committee are elected through approved voting. That was a change from two years ago. 
uh, Judicial Committee as well through approval voting. We use uh, essentially uh, it, 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 it's runoff voting for the officers. Uh, it's not instant runoff voting. And and the reason that uh, I brought up that using instant runoff voting, well, it is um, it is a more sophisticated. I'll use that word. Uh, it is a straightforward, but but challenging vote counting process, which if you had a computer, it'd be done like that. But we don't have a computer ready to go for our votes in a convention hall. So, so it would be tougher using some sort of instant runoff voting regime in, in there. And, and also the fact that we're all together. This isn't a outside of the real world election where you have a whole second election. If you're, if you're not going to use plurality, well, somebody doesn't have a majority. Oh, geez. Now, the first Tuesday in December, when everybody is focused on the holidays, we're going to we're going to have a, we're going to have to have another runoff election. It's not like that. We're all together. Okay, nobody won a majority. We eliminate a candidate. We go to a second vote. We're all right here, right now. Uh, so, uh, so it, it's it's we use runoffs and approval voting really for LNC elections, and we'll be using runoff for the president vice president vote on. So it's runoff, but not instant runoff. It's not instant runoff, but we're using runoff That's voting. Pretty much the same things. thing. Right. So uh, anyway, but I, I will also say this, and and, and certainly Frank can, uh, uh, I, I, as I said, I, and I would like to touch on proportional voting systems, which I really think would make third party candidates electable uh, in, in our nation. Uh, but I will also say this, I do think that approval vote. I think approval voting is has its place some places more than others, such as with the Libertarian Party National Convention. It's it's not when let's take the Libertarian. Let's take the at large the five positions running at large. It's not a it's not a highly contested race. Okay, for for LNC at large positions. Yes, everybody running would like to be elected. I would fortunate to have been elected a number of times to uh, at large positions on the National Committee. It's not a, a highly contested race, number one. And approval voting, vote counting, is a lot simpler than some sort of vote transfer process. We could use choice voting. I mean, frankly, I would prefer using choice voting, a uh, single transferable vote for LNC at large, but how are we going to do it? There are practical problems at this time without better voting technology at our conventions. Um, but out in the out, out of the real world in highly contested elections, I, I I do think one of the problems with approval voting would be um, strategic voting, just as we face with with plurality, because um, and there's some evidence for this in the past. Uh, Buckland voting was used years ago. I don't, may not know what Buckland voting is, but but this is where you ranked. This is where each voter ranked their candidates, and they looked at everybody's. This is different from instant runoff voting. They would look at everybody's first choice. I'll tell you how I think it worked. Everybody's first choice, and then they would add, and then they looked at everybody's second choice, and they added that to the vote total for each candidate. And then they, if they had, if nobody had a majority of votes at that time, or over 50% of the total number of people voted, then they looked at people's third choices. And there was not a vote transfer process, it was just added. So it was sort of a, Delayed, delayed response approval voting situation. But these were out in real world, highly competitive races. Uh, and, and what happened was, ultimately, that, that I believe it was in Alabama for many years, what I've read is that 87% of the voters just ended up casting one vote. Okay, 87% of the voters just ended up casting because they were concerned about the dynamics process because of the violation what is called the later no harm criterion violation. There is no perfect voting system, by the way, and I'm not going to represent instant runoff voting is not perfect either. It has different properties, it has different strengths and different weaknesses versus approval voting. But but let's take let's take a process like um, uh, the, the Republican presidential primary, you know, or or where you've got it's highly contested, it's very contentious. You know, and, and you've got a bunch of voters. Okay, well now, who do I approve? I mean, I've got my favorite candidate. 
where you're going to vote for your favorite candidate, certainly. <coughs> but then the question becomes, okay, who else am I going to approve? You know, uh, and how is that because that how is that going to affect my candidate? Or let's say that I'm voting. Let, let's just say Bill Redpath is going to go vote in a, in a presidential election, and let's say it's the year 2000. I'll admit this, and I would have been I would have been voting <coughs> wrong, but I but I'll admit I would have done this in 2000 if we had this run off voting. I would have cast my first choice for Harry Brown, and I would have cast my second choice for George W. Bush. Now within before the, I would not have done that in 2004. I guarantee you, I would not have passed any vote for George W. Bush in 2004. And probably I would have in 2000, with it, if I had rank choice. But if it were approval, I would have passed a vote for Harry Brown. But then I would have thought, hmm, I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I want to give another candidate the same degree of respect or support in my voting that I gave Harry Brown in 2000. And so I think in a very complicated situation where you've got 10 or 12 candidates running and, and it's highly um, uh, unharmonious and, and people have very strong feelings, uh, I, I think that's another reason why the rent choice system would work better than approval. But I'll hand it over to Frank. Bill's, Bill's mentioning the topic of approval threshold when it comes to approval voting. You as the voter have to decide in your own mind where the threshold is. You might have five candidates, one of them is very, very happy with, the other four you feel mediocre about, you draw the line there. It might be the other way around, that there were four close candidates and one Trumper Clinton, but I won't mention their names, <laughs> there, and you might say, I'll go with all of the four above and avoid them. Bill's completely right that with approval voting, you, the voter, have to reach a approval threshold. And my question to you is, if your second candidate wins, will you still be happy? If then maybe your line should be below that second candidate. If you're not going to be happy if the second candidate wins, don't, don't go down into the weeds. Decide what you're going to do. I understand. I'm just, my concern is when things really get contentious, the, the strategic urge with many voters is going to pop up again. That's, <coughs> and I, and there's, there's less of a possibility of that happening with, with a range choice system. But if I make, and I'll get the question. Yes. But we'll go to the question. I do want to explain proportional voting systems because in, in, for legislatures, because I think that's the real key for the future of the LP. Is, like is there uh, language you pushed out to the state uh, military first to seek to have uh, put on, to put into the uh, state assemblies they voted on? There have been bills in various legislatures for this, and uh, I could, I'm sure Fair Vote has uh, language. Uh, also, there is um, no doubt there's language for the law that will be instituted in Maine that people are going to vote on. It's an initiative. Yeah, yeah, there's an initiative, and there's a law that they're not printing the whole law about, but I'm pretty darn sure. But, but but there is a law that would be instituted and written up. So so there is certainly model legislation that is available, and, I, and I'm sure that's the case for approval uh, voting, because you've been doing that in Colorado. Right, stop by our, de our desk, our approval voting book has proposed way. Great. Yes. Yes. Now, with respect to proportional representation, there are, of course, you know, voting systems are only limited by human imagination. Uh, but, but there are three main proportional voting systems that are in use around the world. Uh, one is called a party list system, whereby, uh, and there are two different types of party list system. There's an open party list and a closed party list. And a closed party list system is where people only vote for the party. There are no candidates on the ballot. They just vote for their favorite party. This is how uh, Movemento Libertario and I forget when they're holding the next election. Do you know Frank in Costa Rica? I'm not sure offhand. 
But anyway, but that is how really they come to life. I don't know how many of you just happened to be at the 2002 convention in Indianapolis. Um, do you remember? Who's the guy? Otto, Otto Guevara. There we go. Thank you. Otto Guevara uh, spoke at the 2002 convention and spoke about the importance of proportional representation and, um, uh, and, and how, you know, he said, tell the American people about, or tell your libertarian brothers and sisters about proportional representation because we in Costa Rica would be in the same boat as you as a libertarian party, but for the voting system. And last time I checked, they had maybe nine to 57 seats, I think, something like that. I forget, but they, they have at least been as high out of, I think, 57 seats in the Costa Rican legislature. But anyway, in that case, people just voted for a party, and then the by province in Costa Rica, the number, the, the number of delegates per party was based on the percentage of votes in that province. Uh, but then there's open party lists where people vote for their favorite party and their favorite candidate within that party, and then the actual individuals, instead of being put, excuse me, put into the legislature by the party, are decided by the public and vote for the individual candidates. So that's party list voting. So, and there can be certain thresholds, you know, no party below three percent or two percent or five percent gets any seats at all. They got to hit that minimum party list threshold vote in any seats at all. I think if we had party list, closed party list, well, I'm sure it would go nowhere in the United States, but, but an open party list system, you never know. Probably less likely than other systems. But, it, but I think that with a system like that, Libertarian Party would be any major party in the United States. Then there's another system, mixed member proportional, where uh, they use it, for instance, with the Bundestag, the national legislature in Germany. You're a voter, you go into the voting booth. You don't get one ballot, you get two. One ballot is a single member plurality election, just like we have here in the United States. And the second ballot is a party list vote. And they fill out half the legislature based upon the, uh, the single member plurality elections, and the other half of the legislature is filled out based on the party list vote. And the parties get to appoint people to the legislature, and ultimately the legislature can round it out based on percentages by party on the party list vote. So again, if there was a party, uh, the FDP at one point, which was somewhat libertarian in, in uh, uh, I think they've fallen off in Germany, but at one point, I think they got 14% of the vote in Germany. They didn't win any of the single member district elections, but they got 14% of the vote in one election, and they got 14% of the seats in the voting stock because of that. 14% of the voters said the FDP is my favorite party. That's the second system. Third system is a sort of what I mentioned before, single member districts, excuse me, multi-member districts, uh, and, and having and using choice voting or single transferable vote. There are two types of wasted votes, excess votes for winners and all votes for losers. And what, and what uh, choice voting does is, uh, it's just a very sophisticated process. It, it would be better if you're really interested, go online, and Google choice voting or single transferable vote. There are videos that, that give you examples of vote transfer processes, but excess votes of winners and all votes of losers are transferred through really an easy, a sophisticated, but if you watch an easily understandable process that ultimately gives uh, political minorities legislative life. I mean, if, if you've got, you know, uh, if you've got uh, nine seats uh, and you only need about uh, one ninth of the vote, ultimately, including vote transfers, uh, to to gain a seat on the city council or in the legislature. So, so what it does again is it gets away from sort of the majoritarian single member district concept, first past the post voting that we use here, with multi members and, and, and lower vote totals necessary for election. It gives political minorities a real shot at, at representation in, in those legislatures. At the end of the day, I think the real problem facing the Libertarian Party is I think that we're a political minority and the winner take all voting system. That's our big problem. And that's mm -hmm. what Frank and I are addressing. Um, I'm going to squeeze in a pitch with regards to flyers at the approval voting desk they'll uh, exhibit. There's two events coming up. One is Freedom Fest, in which the question is, are elections killing our freedoms? And the next item is a third annual electoral symposium, Saturday, November 19th, 
in Boulder, Colorado, uh, sponsored by Free and Equal Elections. I think we'll get Blake as an I just have a quick question. Uh, I love proportional representation, okay? Um, there's issues with it, but that can be worked out, okay? But I see so much trouble getting approval. Voting adopted, I see so much trouble with higher rank of voting. Being adopted and then being taken down, there's issues with that. How would we ever get proportional representation? Through issues. I mean, first of all, I couldn't How do we implement it? How could we implement it? Uh, the technology is there, the voting machines to do it. I mean, in terms of, they're, they're absolutely computers, there are programs. It, it's, there have been technology issues with, but more and more machines certainly didn't handle the proof of the question. But, but, um, uh, but doing the vote transfers, um, there is more and more voting equipment that can do rank choice voting. And it's just a matter of, um, of, of, of upgrades that would allow them to, to handle uh, uh, choice voting. Yes, sir. Uh, under, <clears throat> under approval voting, it's possible for two or more candidates to get a majority, correct? More than a majority of the voters, yes. Because, because more, about, more votes are being cast Right. Than there are ballots uh -huh. and voters. Yes. I see. But it's, it's, but it's it's possible. Yes, it's it's possible that um, conceivable, perhaps, that all the candidates might get a majority, but right. one of them is going to get more. Of a majority. So, yes, whoever gets the biggest. Majority. The, the biggest. Yes, most votes. Yes. Pardon me. We did a, we did a, an actual straw poll. One event where we were saying who should be in the Republican debates. Now, ben Carson won vote for our plurality and approval voted. Ted Cruz was second, so no change there. But what happened on the plurality side, Bobby Jindal got zero, for example, just taking it for example, got zero plurality votes and was approved on 50% of the ballots. And so for me, if I'm a Bobby Jindal, I'd like to know that. I shouldn't be tired. I, mean, I actually, the market is there for me. I just didn't get the position for it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to keep pushing. Okay? Not that I'm a supporter of him. That's the power of the world. Questions, thoughts? Thank you very much for being here. Uh, it's, it's a tough topic. <laughs> 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 <laughs>